Welcome to Breaking the Silence with Dr. Gregory Williams. Dr. Williams is the author of the acclaimed book, Shattered by the Darkness, Putting the Pieces Back Together After Child Abuse. Dr. Williams is on the senior leadership team at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. And Dr. Williams travels the United States speaking and training professionals, parents, and victims about the importance of dealing with abuse and personal trauma head on and not being afraid to break the silence of your own personal pain. Feel free to call in to tonight's show at... 888-627-6008 and speak with Dr. Williams and his guests live on air. And now, your host, Dr. Williams. the silence and we are live in houston texas the most beautiful city in the world it's dark here tonight the sun just went down and uh looking over the texas medical center i always like to let you know where i'm at that this isn't a, a fake background it's actually the texas medical center over there md anderson hospital texas children's hospital baylor college of medicine the methodist hospital memorial Hermann. there's about 10 hospitals within a block of where I live right here, it's just called the Texas Medical Center. It is the absolute largest employment center in the entire state of Texas. We have more employees right here. Matter of fact, the population right here is larger than downtown Dallas. Uh, and we just, I just love being part of, of Houston and uh, Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital. It's just a blessing to be part of such a great organization. And uh, you know, tonight, we uh, want you to be able to write down a, a few things. And uh, first of all, I want you to write down 888-627-6008 because I have a feeling that you're going to want to maybe call in. You may have a comment. You may have a question about what we're going to talk about tonight. And uh, it's going to be really, really a good um, subject that I think that you may have that you're dealing with in your own life, maybe you personally. Uh, maybe somebody that you know in your family or a friend that you're going to run into next week. So make sure you kind of watch what we're going to talk about tonight. Write down guest names, their contacts, and how to get a hold of them afterwards. And uh, the next two weeks, we're going to have really, um, it's kind of, uh, we're, we had James Brown on from Illinois a few weeks ago. And James talked about his battle, his journey uh, with alcoholism, with his use of uh some medication and mixing that with alcoholism. And uh, he went to this one center uh, called Recover Us that, that just literally uh, gave him treatment that, that for now I think he told me just a while ago that he's four months clean uh, and just loved the center. And I immediately when I heard about how effective it was in his life, uh, we decided to invite uh, them, uh, a few of from recover us on the program tonight, and that's going to be our guest tonight. Now, next week, kind of uh, piggybacking off this program, James Brown and his wife, Lisa Brown, is going to be on the program next week to look at addiction, uh, this journey together, but from the wife's point of view and what happens in the home with the kids and the wife and or the husband, whichever way uh, it is. Um, and how to give them help and offer help. So it's going to be a good uh, tonight, and next week's going to be really special. And then the following week, the first week in November, we have Alice Cooper and some of his staff from uh, the Alice Cooper Youth Camps uh, in um, Phoenix, Arizona. He has a youth center there and does some great work, and we're going to have him on and a therapist or two from his group. And then uh, Dr. Bruce Perry is going to be here, I think, the following week. And if you don't know Dr. Bruce Perry, that's probably going to be one of the, the biggest shows that we've ever had uh, because Dr. Bruce Perry is a New York Times bestseller. And uh, he wrote uh, The Child Raised by a Dog. And it's literally been in the top uh, books being sold 
uh, year after year after year, and he's going to be on. It's going to be a great, great guest. We have uh, some wonderful guests for the rest of the year, so make sure you just tune in. We really believe that if you give us a few minutes of your time on a Sunday night, I looked at the TV guide. There's not that much on tonight. Why not watch something that's going to help you make you a better person and be able to give you one inch closer to some hope in your life and be able to help somebody else out. So that's what we're asking for you to do tonight. Before we have our guest on, I, every now and then I like to just throw out a few things that I think that, that you can use this coming week. So before we get to Kelly and Seth, I'm just going to take a couple minutes. I want to kind of get rid of some baggage tonight. If you really want to be able to move forward in your life, I want to tell you and maybe suggest some things that you should get rid of before you can make progress forward. And one of those things is letting other people's opinions control your life. Let me tell you, you need to get rid of that tonight. You need to get rid of that right now. Nobody else's opinion matters. Do what you think you need to do for you. And sometimes we are, if we're gonna spend the rest of our life trying to make somebody else happy for the rest of our life, we're going to always be chasing after something that we're never going to be able to obtain. So don't let other people's opinions uh, control your life. Another thing to get rid of, the shame of past failures. Hey, been there, done that. And I, I have taken that shame with me, but tonight's the time to leave the baggage behind. Cut the strings from that shame of past failures. Start today with something fresh and new. Don't continue to bring up the past. You can't relive that. Start from today and move forward. Another thing that I think kind of goes hand in hand with what uh, we're talking about tonight, uh, being dis decisive, um, being indecisive on what you want. I think tonight is the night that you need to make a decision. Just huddle up with me, just lean in here if you're, if you're listening. If you don't make a decision tonight about doing something that you know you should do in your life, when are you gonna do it? When do you have it on your calendar? If it's not tonight, why not start right now and make that decision that you also, that you know that you need to make. Procrastination on the goals that matter to you will always be a negative side of that ledger book. So get rid of that procrastination and make an action. And I think another thing we need to get uh, out of our system is choosing to do nothing. I always told my, my kids when they were going through grade school uh, in Southern Illinois, I always told them, hey, when you go into a class, always shoot for an A. And if you end up getting to B or C, at least you shot for an A and not having any kind of goals, not having any kind of action plan and coming in at a C or D isn't acceptable. Always shoot for what you think you want to obtain and at least have a goal. And uh, that's going to help you in life. And then running away from problems that you know should be fixed. Get rid of that. Um, now's the time to honestly go into the bathroom and look into the mirror and really authentically, genuinely, sincerely look in the mirror and say, this is who I am. This is what I'm dealing with. This is the problems that I have in front of me. And then come up with an action plan to be able to help and get help to overcome those problems. And making excuses rather than decisions is the other thing that we, I really want to encourage you to get rid of. Just a few things uh, tonight to leave the program tonight, maybe hopefully a little lighter. Okay, that's enough of my stuff. I'll throw my soapbox to the side and, and we'll get to our guests because they're the ones that have all the knowledge. We have from Recover Us in Carbondale, Illinois, my alma mater, SIU Carbondale, go Salukis. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we have uh, Seth Dor Duran. That's Dewarin. I would have never pulled that one out. That's DeWaren, an awful French name. Seth DeWaren, and Seth is the nursing supervisor of Recover Us Centers. And Kelly Reed, she is the developer 
the partner, the clinic administrator. I got a feeling that Kelly is the boss. But Kelly Reed and Seth is with us tonight. And welcome to the program from Carbondale, Illinois. How you doing? Yeah, oh, so good. Great. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's, it's an honor to have you. And I have all these bios here that I can read about you. But um, before we get to the boss, Seth, tell me what you do. What is your role at Recover Us? What do you do? Um, I, essentially, I just run point on everything medical. Um, uh, I, I avail myself to educate uh, potential clients to make sure that they are knowledgeable about why our program works for them. Um, I run point while they're here in the clinic, run, uh, you know, doing their medical care, uh, coordinating with the medical director, any providers uh, that we have here, and uh, just running all that uh, under the tutelage of Kelly and my ownership. Okay, fantastic. And then Kelly, um, what was the dream that you have? Because to my understanding, you started this. Yeah. How did that come about? What was you after? And have you reached that dream in what Recover Us uh, is doing right now for the community? I think that my dream grows continually and it's fueled by each time we have someone here and we're able to see how that reflects with their family, with their loved ones, uh, and what it does for them in their lives. So I think that's ever growing and evolving uh, as we're here. Um, okay, now if people didn't see uh, and didn't watch James's uh, interview the other day, they don't even know what Recover Us is. So. Either one of you, you can play back and forth with each other and each describe, but what is this center and what's its purpose and what, how do you treat and who do you treat? We treat people throughout the United States. So it's not just a regional uh, clinic. We have people, we just had some people left from California. So we treat people from all throughout the United States with drug and alcohol addiction. And that is um, prim primarily what we do here at the clinic. Okay, now Seth, is this uh, drug and alcohol addiction, is this um, street drugs? Or uh, is yes. this medicinal drugs that maybe they got involved with with pain medication and they couldn't get off? Or is it any kind of addiction to any kind of substance. It's the latter, yeah. Any type of addiction um, falls under these uh, formulas that we have, even compulsory addictions, things that are non-medical, uh, like uh, gambling, uh, pornography, things of that nature. Oh, okay. That's a whole different ballgame. Yeah. Okay, so we're, we're, you're talking about any addiction whatsoever. So list, if you would, because I got a feeling there may be people watching tonight that don't know they're addicted. Uh, right. So what kind of addictions are on this checklist that you all treat? Um, th th well, through any type of drug, like I said, so cocaine, methamphetamine, uh, clonopin, so any type of benzodiazepine, Xanax, um, uh, any type of opioid or opiate, um, alcohol, like I said, gambling, uh, pornography, um, any anything that falls under anything that's compulsory. It pretty much it, it covers everything. There's a specific okay. formula that, that has uh, amino acids and a particular amount of NAD that focuses on that receptor, um, especially with serotonin and dopamine. Wow, now you're, you're using language that, uh, oh, <laughs> no, no, because I want to dig deeper into that because it's like, oh, can I wait? So have you seen um, what the opioid uh, problem has become in the last five years? Or is it just in the bigger cities or is it hitting uh, places just in the rural parts of the country too? It, I think it would be hard pressed, anyone would be hard pressed to meet someone that doesn't have or know someone that has been affected by addiction. So cities, rural areas, it seems that it's everywhere. Uh, I don't think geographically it's limited to any location. So, okay, we have all these lists of alcohol and the drugs and then the gambling and pornography because I know those two uh, can be just as addictive and just as destructive to a person and relationships. 
Um, how does a person know that they have an addiction? How do you realize it? I think most people uh, deep down inside them, they know when they have an addiction. They know when um, it either is something that is done through withdrawals, if it is uh, pain pills, any type of opioids, alcohol, they themselves know. Whether they have voiced that concern, um, that can be a different story. But I, I do believe that they know themselves when they have an addiction, when they're doing something that is controlling their life and it's taking over their thoughts and affecting their family and their loved ones and their job, they know when they have a problem. Now you mentioned, uh, Seth, I believe you had a person from California that graduated from the program this evening? Yes, sir. Now, were they actually in Illinois when that happened? Or was it via Zoom and Skype? Or... <clears throat> no, they were here. They, they came from California and tonight was their last night to cover 14 days of treatment and he just left, so. Okay, so you have a, a residential uh, treatment plan there or do they stay at a, a local hotel and get treatment during the day or how does that uh, work in the treatment? So we have an outpatient facility and I think that's one of the other things that sets us apart from other treatment facilities. Uh, so someone comes in in the morning and they generally spend six to eight hours with us throughout the day receiving their treatment while they're here. And then they're free to go home in the evening if they're local. Um, if they're coming in from out of town, we have a hotel that's right next door. They go next door. Um, they can have their family with them. They can either uh, bring a family member too, which is so important. If they have a strong support system, we invite that at our facility. And that serves so many purposes, um, both for the families and the individuals that are struggling. Um, that to, to me is one of the very important things that, that sets us apart from other facilities. Kelly, when you developed or when you decided to open this uh, clinic, um, was there, and we have not talked about this, so if, if right. you say, hey, great, we're not going there, right. uh, feel free. Is there a personal story behind this or was it just uh, a journey that you was going on professionally? And then there is definitely a personal story. And I think Seth and I have found in traveling and educating doctors or healthcare facilities or employers, whenever we're telling the story, you can generally spot the person in the room that has a personal experience with addiction. They receive the information differently. They're more emotionally invested than most. And they will always come up to us and talk to us about that experience. So that's been extremely refreshing. But back to your question, my um, I come from a very, very close family, um, a younger brother and a younger sister. And we all go to dinner together, go to movies together and, and share in everything with one another. And we noticed some differences um, in behavior with my younger brother. And we watched those evolve, but we weren't, we weren't educated in addiction and we didn't know what signs to look for. And we were probably very naive in that area, like most families are who haven't experienced it. Yeah. Um, so we saw behaviors changing in him and one day he comes to us and I'll, I'll never forget the look in his eye. And whenever he said to us, I have a problem and I need help, I'm addicted to pain medication. And then, you know, you can retrace things in your mind and those pieces start to fit together with behaviors versus what he's telling us. And it was, it was a time I'll, I'll never forget. Um, it was, it stands out in my mind as a time that really changed for us as a family. So does that build in you um, a resiliency of uh, purpose? Oh, of, yeah. I want to be that light for the darkness that I possibly 
didn't receive or did you have a good experience in the treatment uh, that he had that you said, hey, wait, I want to duplicate this. So I want to provide that kind of hope for other people. Well, in the beginning, we set out um, to be on task for everyone in our family, started doing their part in helping him research various types of treatment. And that was a daunting task um, yeah. to call facilities all throughout the United States. Um, many times you don't get in touch with someone, um, addiction or the information stopped at 5 p.m. And we all know now that addiction doesn't have hours. It's through the weekend and after hours. So, um, and you know, being a family that we're still working, it was, it was difficult to find time to call and get the answers for treatment options that we needed for him. Uh, so eventually he um, found no treatment facility, but on our own, we did so much research into various types of treatments that could be given to him and that he could have to build a foundation for long-term sobriety. And those were found um, hit or miss in various places, but not everything all in one location. Right. Um, so after that, we said, let's take our experience and what the knowledge that we gained through this terrible time in our lives and share his positive outcomes that he had with treatment and with others. And we knew what we wanted to be in a facility for families and for those people that are struggling. Wow, awesome, awesome. Tell you what, we're gonna take a first commercial break. And Seth, I'm gonna kind of give you, uh, I'll, I'll grease the wheel a little bit. I'm fixing to, to turn the spotlight to you. Is there a reason that you're uh, doing what you're doing with the population of people that you are doing it with, just to see if there's something there too that maybe has uh, given you uh, a point of contact and remember. So I'm going to come back and ask you that. On the other side of this break, if you want to call in 888-627-6008, don't leave us. Call somebody, let them know to tune in to bbsradio.com and Breaking the Silence. We'll be right back right after this first commercial break. <laughs> This couldn't be coming at a better time. Have you ever felt like you were just trapped and couldn't find your way out of darkness? Have you ever felt like you were drowning and fighting to find your next breath? Well, coming in 2020 will be the second of a three-part trilogy, my new book, Overcoming the Darkness, The Roadmap to Hope. This new book will provide you a step-by-step -step approach of how to reach that destination that important destination called hope. Now, two additional resources are gonna be made available when this book is released. One, the map to hope. It'll be a handy guide that you can carry around with you, put in your briefcase or put in your purse. And this guide is gonna help you find your way when you're stuck in life looking and searching for hope. And then the other resource, the Overcoming the Darkness Companion Journal. I have always believed that journaling is the first step to finding real healing and hope in your life. And this journal will guide you down that path. I'm excited about these resources in this new book that's going to be released in 2020, the Summer of Hope. Now back to the next segment of Breaking the Silence with Dr. Gregory Williams right here on BBS Radio. the orchestra a lot of money to play that song i just want you to know that <laughs> i'll tell you what my uh, my texts are going off the the board tonight which is people uh saying hey i'm listening uh this is a great show so we're hitting the nerve and uh we're and i love it when people comment good or bad but this is all good so far that i can see but i love that when they do because we know that we're hitting on a subject that maybe the world doesn't talk about much, uh, even though it seems like there's a lot of information about that. But we have Seth and Kelly from Recover Us in Carbondale, Illinois. And I lived in Carbondale, Illinois for years. I love the strip. Uh, 
I don't know if they even have the infamous strip of Halloween Thank still. You. We used to leave town during <laughs> Halloween because you didn't want to be around Carbondale during that week. But uh, I just love Carbondale, a great, great community, and uh, love Southern Illinois. But uh, Seth, tell me, what, what got you involved in this type of work? Um, pretty much, uh, addiction's already been something that's been really dear to me. I grew up in Chester, which is uh, about 45 minutes Absolutely. from Carbondale. Um, it's got one of the biggest penitentiaries there in Chester. And uh, whenever I was a younger uh, boy, um, there was somebody, uh, a gang affiliated that got put in there. Uh, a large gang moved to Chester at that time. And I just firsthand experienced and watched drugs infusing uh, a town that, that weren't there as prevalent as before. And um, to this day, I have dozens of, of classmates from my school alone. I, I think I only had 100 people in my graduating class but there's dozens of people from our school that have died from uh, heroin, drug overdoses. Um, my little brother's best friend um, passed away from a heroin overdose. So it's something that's just very, very dear to know that like, you know, I, just like anybody else, addiction can touch anybody. It's not an impoverished in individual that it targets. It, it targets from the top of the food chain to the bottom. And to know that, you know, I escaped that town and, and left and, um, and I'm where I'm at today. And to know that it could have not ended up that way. And that gives me passion to try to be there for people to help them. And whenever um, I met Kelly and my ownership here, and I saw just how well this all worked, I was like, there's no way I can't do this. This is, I'm going all in and I haven't looked back since. So. Well, that's great. I'll tell you what, um, if, if you had to pick out, we do have James Brown on the line. So we'll, we're going to bring James in here. Oh, James, do you want to jump in? Are you where we can see or just hear you tonight? James? He may be eating popsicles. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> My son told me that James is is on the line, but it, are you there, James? Okay. Well, we'll I think uh, he's under the same song uh, from the. Okay, he's connecting now. Uh, while he's connecting in, uh, what's some of the signs? If you had to do a, a checklist of things to to notice, uh, Kelly and Seth of uh, typical uh, addictive signs that you do have an issue? Because uh, I know you probably do conferences and webinars and workshops on this uh, to how to figure out how do you recognize some of a, a sign or two that would indicate to us that we have a problem? I think a lot of individuals, and if you ask someone that suffers, uh, they can really recognize this themselves too. I think they withdraw. They withdraw from a family. They withdraw from um, doing the, the social things that they used to do. Um, so secluding themselves is, I think, one of the telltale signs, behavior changes anxiety, depression, uh, that goes hand in hand with addiction. And many people don't recognize that, that um, those symptoms are increased with addiction and what addiction does to the brain and the brain receptors. So that's, that's key and that's very important to understand, erratic behavior. Um, yeah. Uh, unaccounted so, money and time yeah that's true that's a big one so would this be one of those things that if we have and you know a lot of a lot of men have their man cave in the garage and they go out to the garage and spend the entire evening alone uh and then they come back kind of different than what they were when they went in is that kind of isolation is what you're talking about or is it more of a emotional isolation of not only a physical but an emotional too I think it may be for everyone. I think everything is different. Um, but I think emotional is uh, both emotional and physical isolation seem to be extremely prevalent in anyone that's suffering with addiction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, somebody has a very close family and a family member um, wants to keep to themselves, stay in their room, not attend family events. There's a sense of shame. And a, a lot of families like myself, I didn't understand that whenever you're talking to someone and trying to have um, someone get help, that you don't shame them into doing that. They're, 
shamed in themselves already. And so right. they're not proud of their behavior either. You know, I tell you, um, and if James will connect on the audio, we'll, we'll bring James in because I think they're still having, they're trying to hear him. So James, if you can connect the audio part or the video, either one, and we'll, we'll talk. But I think uh, what I called uh, Recover Us the other day, the whoever you have on the switchboard on the telephone was good. She's All great. I can say is immediately it's like, wow, I just met a friend. And I think <laughs> right. that first impression is precious, do you not? Oh, it's, we call her the glue. So she holds us all together for sure. Um, and that's a goal of our facility. When someone comes in, there's no judgment here. Um, we're here to help. It's, it's not a place that you go for punishment. It's a place where you go to get yourself back again. And so the atmosphere is not depressing. It's a, it's a wonderfully warm atmosphere and that's extremely important for people um, for all people so take me from because i remember james's story so vividly when i think it was his second time of attempting uh to commit suicide and he ended up laying down on the garage floor next to the lawnmower and then because i remember he was getting ready to go to commercial break and he said then i made the most important phone call in my life Take me, Seth, from that moment of that call. If a person calls in to, their, uh, to recover us tonight, what steps are taken from there? Because that may be half the fear of un the unknown. What do you do with them and for them? And I, and I see James, so I'll wait for James. But uh, what do you do actually for them from that point of that first call? I would say from the very beginning, that Kelly always just makes sure that they're safe first and foremost. And I think that that's one of the things that struck James um, so quickly is he, he knew he was not in a safe situation and he heard Kelly's voice. And I remember he told me it was like an angel. <laughs> he, was like, he, he was just so down in a pit of despair, you know, and to, he reached out and to have somebody connect with him and be like, I understand where you're at right now. Let's talk about it. And to be like, oh my goodness, I'm talking to somebody, they understand where I'm at and they're willing to speak right now. I think that that's huge to all hours of the night. You can call and, and you will get Kelly immediately on the phone. And um, so I, that, that's huge uh, to, to speak directly with somebody who has you know, their feet on the ground here in the clinic every single day, this is their life and they're willing to speak to you. Okay, I'm in Houston and I call. What's the first thing that you want to do from me and find out from me? That I, I'm telling you, hey, Seth Kelly, I'm safe. I just know I'm out of control emotionally or with this addiction, whatever it is. How do you, what's the next step for me or that person that needs help with their addiction? What's the first thing you do? Many of them will share their stories if they uh, have gone to other places and maybe not been successful with their recovery, or it could be the very first time that they're reaching out, acknowledging that they need help and they don't know what to do next. So they're looking for answers and they're looking for the ways that we can help them, the ways that we can help. One of the main things I think I hear over and over, I hear this every day, is how can you help me? What I'm afraid to go through the withdrawals. I feel like if I could comfortably, or if I could go through those, I could get to the other side, along with counseling and, and other care that we offer here. But how can you help me? The withdrawals scare me to death. And I'm so de desperately ill when that happens. So. Yeah. James, uh, can you hear Can you hear us now? Are you there, James? I see you. <laughs> James, are you there? Okay, I used to, okay, I can't, I can't hear him yet. But okay, so with the withdrawals, uh, my understanding that, that James as a patient of y'all's uh, had intravenous uh, medication that he was put. Tell me, I, I knew nothing about this. Uh, what is that that you guys have that literally has 
an unbelievable success rate, correct? Yes, sir. Yes. This technique that you use. Um, it's the, the drug is NAD. Um, it stands for nicotinamide adenide dinucleotide. Wow. Um, it's just, it's a coenzyme. Um, and it essentially back in the 80s, um, it was accidentally found as they were exploring for anxiety and depression. Um, they, they realized that it started to suppress withdrawal symptoms in alcoholics. And so they started to just really dig into it deeper. And, you know, decades later, we have a safe FDA approved drug that's been proven to suppress withdrawal symptoms, restore and regenerate brain receptors that accept um, those opiates or alcohol um, and th that have been damaged over the years of substance abuse and to physically regenerate that tissue on your brain um, and to help reduce your cravings going towards uh, the future. And that's one of the biggest um, alluring uh, aspects of it is that craving reduction going forward. and. Uh, so to help prevent relapse. So is this something, Kelly, that you knew of another place that was using it, or is this new cutting edge technique treatment? It's been around for since the early eighties. Early eighties. Oh, uh, shows you what I know. Right, uh, and so a lot of places. There, I'm not going to say a lot. There are other places that do this. I think the difference is some of those places are associated. The docs are associated with universities. Uh, and, and studies uh, through universities. And so their goals are not necessarily like my, I want everyone to know about this. I want everyone to know that they can go through withdrawal, they can get their lives back, they can feel whole again and do so in a safe and comfortable medical environment. I, I don't think a lot of people understand that drugs, be it opioids, benzodiazepines, alcohol, affect the brain receptors. So they may say, well, I've quit. I'm no longer, uh, I'm clean. I've been clean for a week. Uh, that the opioids still affect the brain and the brain receptors. And so uh, even though you may be clean, there's still other steps to help yourself combat withdrawal and addiction throughout your life. And that's very, very important. Do you, do you find, because I mean, my, my uh, experience is with uh, childhood abuse that happened to me and the ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences that does get up and literally dissects and cuts off neurons and different things in the brain and your brain growth and function is completely different than what um, it should be. Do you find that if they've had earlier trauma in their life, that it's a different way of treating their actual abuse or uh, their actual addiction of what they're dealing with at that time? We have a particular client yeah. um, that we've, and obviously for privacy, we won't share um, the client's name, but Seth can tell her story. It was an amazing journey that she had here. Um, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily say that it, their trauma changes the way that we would treat them. Um, I just think that we treat them as a whole individual and it kind of all comes to the forefront. And uh, the person she's re uh, referring to, so we had a young 20 year old girl who came to us. Um, she, she was not addicted to any substances. I, in fact, I don't think she'd even ever taken any type of drug. Um, but she was coming to us for uh, extreme anxiety and depression. Um, and as her story began to unfold, as she was an eight to 13 year old girl, she had been sexually abused by a family member. I mean, dozens and dozens and dozens of times. And um, from that, she became a very recluse, withdrawn individual. Um, she lost interest in school. Um, she withdrew from sports and she had a fantastic sports career um, on the horizon. And um, all that, that anxiety and depression became crippling to the point that as a 20 year old girl, she still lived with her mom. She refused to get a job. She didn't want to be out in public. And it was something that, you know, it haunted her every day. And her mom became desperate to find a solution. So they began to start their journey, but she ended up ultimately with us here. And we treated her for anxiety and depression and uh, to regulate and restore her dopamine and serotonin levels and to start that brain restoration process with the NAD. And then we also coupled it with neurofeedback, which was uh, 
something that we do to restore the brainwave and the, your brainwave patterns to how they're uh, supposed to be with your delta, alpha, theta, and your beta waves. Um, she had an incredibly high alpha wave. Um, it was 50 hertz, which is astronomical. You're supposed to be- Okay, what's that show you? It, it, it shows that there was a tremendous uh, emotional trauma that happened in her youth. And it, yes. and it led to her alpha wave being uh, um, you know, just broken essentially. And through neurofeedback, you can go in and train the brain with auditory cues to put that alpha wave where it's supposed to be. As that began to happen, it only took her about um, five weeks, I think, of neurofeedback, and she did five days of NAD, um, and she had already went out and got a job, uh, tried to go find a new place to live, and and I, I had never seen somebody make such a dramatic flip from a very quiet, withdrawn person to a... Total social anxiety into yeah. a, a girl whose personality was restored, and her mother said, this is what she was like when she was a younger girl. And, you know, her mom was able to see that and she was able to see it. I mean, it was absolutely amazing. And it's a gift to get to see individuals who struggle with addiction, who have those issues, um, come into their own and begin to heal. And I'm sure you know much more than, than I about the addiction, how it affects a brain receptor. And people, I, I don't think initial treatment focuses on what addiction and or trauma does specifically to the brain and the brain patterns. Um, so I, 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 I love the fact that you're looking at the whole person. Definitely. Because you can't, you can't just go in and, and fix one piece because everything is related to that. Definitely. We're going to dig a little deeper on the other side of this break. James, can you just say howdy to see if we got <laughs> the audio fixed? Are you there? Howdy. Hey, hey. It's good to see you, my friend. And it's wonderful that you put the suit on for us tonight. Thank you. <laughs> I know, I did. I got my, I, I'm wearing my Tampa Bay Buccaneers hat. They really, hey, no bucks. Hey, they, <laughs> hey, they, 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 they beat the undefeated Packers today. So, hey. Oh, well, that's good. Anytime you beat Green Bay, we're in good shape. <laughs> yeah, 38, 38 to 10. It was a beating. Yes, it okay, was. fantastic. Tell you what, we're going to take a commercial break. Remember, the mics are hot. Uh, and we're going to take our last commercial break. And on the other side of this, we're going to bring James in to see how uh, much of an impact uh, Seth and Kelly that you made on his life. So I want him to share from his heart just for a second. On the other side of this break, don't leave us. The last segment's going to be awesome. Right back on the other side of this commercial. <laughs> HCI Publishing that brought you the international bestsellers, A Child Called It, and the Chicken Soup for the Soul series comes the latest book by Dr. Gregory Williams, Shattered by the Darkness. This book describes the horrific abuse that Dr. Williams suffered at the hands of his father for over 12 years and the damaging effect of keeping everything silent about that abuse for 30 years. If you're looking for that book that you can't put down, then pick up a copy of Shattered by the Darkness by Dr. Gregory Williams at all Barnes & Noble stores, Amazon, and Books A Million. Now, back to Breaking the Silence with Dr. Gregory Williams. All righty, welcome back. Yeah, that's Shattered by the Darkness. I hit the top 100 again this week on Amazon. I don't know why, but uh, the book is still selling pretty good. And the Overcoming the Darkness, the Roadmap to Hope is, and James, I have, I've quoted you in the second chapter. Uh, wow. Well, so yeah, you're going to be in the book. I quoted you in the second chapter because it's, it's on authenticity and being uh, genuine. And that chapter is called this. Are you ready? The second yeah. chapter is called, I'm fine and neither are you. <laughs> because I tell you what, that authenticity 
makes all the difference in the world. And I remember we really got serious on that. And you're going to be with us uh, next week, you and your lovely wife. But James, tell me what Kelly and Seth uh, has meant to you in your life. You know, it's uh, it, it it's kind of hard to really uh, give kudos to uh, Kelly and Seth. Um, they've become really good friends, which uh, I hate to say they saved my life. Wow. That's kind of the, the best way I can say it. Um, you know, like I, I told you earlier, we talked on the phone, Greg, that, you know, uh, Four and a half months ago, if I would have thought I would be where I'm at now, uh, I never would have thought it would have been possible. And and that's why, uh, you know, God brings people into our lives. And he definitely brought uh, Kelly and Seth into my life at a time where uh, it was so providential and so needed. Uh, I, I can't tell them how much they mean to me. Uh, with words. I just, I can't do it. So. Well, I'll tell you what, I've been watching every one of your little videos that you have had with Seth on the recover us uh, site. I recommend everybody blow those videos absolutely out of the water with watching them and sharing them and uh, let people know to get on that site because those Seth, you did an excellent job. Uh, just interviewing James and getting about what the program's all about and how that works. And I, there was like 10 of them, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I really, really, uh, not only I didn't watch them just because they were James, but yeah, really I did. I just wanted <laughs> to hear what he had to say, but uh, it was a great job doing that. How, how does that make you feel if you have a guy that is sitting there uh, in the Carterville area saying, I'm alive because of you guys. It, I think it really just um, justifies and encourages us to just go harder because there's more Jameses out there and we've got to find them and, and to help them and avail ourselves to them. Um, that's, all, that, that, that's why we're doing what we do. Yeah. The fact that he's willing to speak up and share his story to help others. I'll never forget one thing he said to me in the very beginning. No. He said, I'm not a people person. And by the time he left, I said, you were the most people person probably of anyone I've ever met. <laughs> and to watch he and his family um, go through the experience and do so with such courage. Anyone that's addicted shows such immense courage and determination. It's to be admired yeah. for them and what they have to do. Um, so... Do you think when we get to a point that you say, I need help, that's not the weakest point in your life? That could be the strongest? It's definitely James, what do you think? James? What's, what was that again? When you say, when you're at the point in your life where you say, I need help, isn't the weakest point of a person's life. It could be the strongest. Yeah, it, it's both. I mean, it. It is the weakest. It was the weakest time in my life, but at the same time, it was the strongest point of my life. Like I said, you know, uh, you know, carrying the facade of 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 trying to uh, uh, meet up with the standards of what my peers and what my friends thought I should be, which I wasn't, to be able to uh, uh, open up and say, hey, look. Uh, I'm an addict, you know, I, I, I can't, I can't function without, you know, uh, drinking, uh, you know, vodka every night and popping pills. And to admit that, uh, it seems like, you know, you're being weak, but yet at the same time, it was the, the strongest point of my life ever to say, Hey, I need help. And, and I think the strongest people that I know are the people who say I need help. I agree. Good point. And I think there's a great scripture on that. And my, at my weakest point, he is the strongest because at that point it's like, God, I can't do this on my own. And he said, finally, you admit to that. Now let me get in you and help you make a, make some choices. Mm -hmm. 
is there any spiritual portion of the program that you offer, uh, Kelly or Seth, or is this all technical and medical and research scientific? No, I, I think the one of the biggest things is that every person is so different and every yes. individual is so complex. And to withhold spiritual healing from somebody who desires it and needs it would be doing them a disservice. If anybody is ever willing to pray or or desires that for me, I'm there in a heartbeat. But obviously you have to use um, professionalism and I, I would never uh, put that on somebody. Right. Whenever you're a nurse, you learn to you know, feel that rapport and, and what you should and shouldn't say. But I do believe spiritual healing is an immense thing um, for people. And I know James went through a lot of it himself, so. And they right. can also um, request a faith-based counselor yep. while they're here too. So the behavioral health yes. part is, is, is part of the package. We've tried to think of everything we could to give someone the, the information and the tools to get to where they need to be. So if part of that for them is uh, faith-based counseling, we we have that covered. I, I think oh, the first time oh, it actually see. came up, we actually, the first time it came up where we got a faith-based counselor, he actually gave his heart to the Lord here in the clinic um, with his counselor there in one of his sessions. It was pretty cool. Do you do a holistic approach too? As for, uh, by, by meaning... Yeah, what? I, mean, I mean, do you do anything that, like, if you want to include uh, the natural uh, elements and natural uh, 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 aromas and like smells? Aromatherapy, things yes. of that nature. Definitely. So all of that is yes. clear. Okay, now we only have five minutes. So I knew this time would go too fast. I talked too much at the beginning. I got Not stop. at all. Not at all. <laughs> but, I loved uh, it. What, what happens if somebody has... And they don't have addiction per se, but they have severe trauma. For instance, me five years ago, and I was going downhill with what had happened to me as a youth. Would you have been able to help me in that? Would I have been a potential client for you if I called and said, hey, wait, I was sexually abused as a child. I need help. Would you be able to do something with that? Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's only because of those receptors in the neuro uh, side of that? Yes. And someone doesn't have to have a referral to be able to come here. Obviously, that would be addressed with the behavioral health counselors and the, pr the proper person within the clinic. Uh, and they make a treatment plan for that person. But it's it, it, primarily, I believe that we deal with addiction, but many, many times, a lot of those things go hand in hand. Yeah, they do. Do you, do you often find, and we're down about three minutes, do you often find that addiction comes from being, so if you negate that, so there's a process in the intake or there's a process through the counseling Yes. That you actually, yeah. you, do you have a, like a, a checklist that they answer on a, you just get to know they do, them. They do a detailed six level ASAM assessment. That's a very in-depth interview confidentially with the behavioral health counselors and specialists here at the clinic. So yes, they do go through that process with them. How many people do you treat at one time? I mean, how many people are in your program per se right now? Well, we, we've lessened the amount because of COVID. So yeah. everyone, so we're keeping socially distanced from one another. Everyone has a private room. So we can do, we can treat up to six, eight people at a time and they each have their own spaces. Okay, fantastic. If somebody in the closing minutes, if somebody wants to get in touch with you right now, they're listening to the program or maybe a repeat of it next week on a podcast somewhere, and they say, hey, wait, these people, I need help with them. They can help me. How would they reach out to you? What's the best way for them to get in touch with you? They can uh, email us. But the, I feel the best is just a good old fashioned phone call. Um, they can call our number 618. 519-9444. Four, four. 
and um, just let us know there's someone there that generally gets back with them um, within um, two hours. So if a, a, like my situation was whenever we, I talked to James, I think if James can uh, verify this, I, we talked late one Sunday evening. And uh, I think he was actually surprised that he got anyone on the phone. And we just yeah. had a great conversation mm -hmm. And he was very open and honest in that first call, which leads him to where he is now. Fantastic, fantastic. 618-519-9444, 24 seven. Yes. From anywhere in the country, how yes. about in the world? We yes. Talk, yeah, we talk to wow, yeah. okay, <laughs> because you're going to get a call from New Zealand because we have a huge uh, listening off, uh, audience in New Zealand. Uh, I can't tell you how, how happy I am to have you, Kelly and, and Seth and James, uh, to be with the program tonight and the work that you're doing. May God bless you and God speed everything you're doing and uh, the impact that you're making on so many people's lives. Thank you. That's special. And, thank and you. And thank you for getting this information out to more people to help them, to let them know that there are options. Yeah, I'll tell you what, uh, by what I'm seeing on my texts and my emails, it just as far as I can see down, uh, a lot of people are reaching out and I'll, I'll find out if there's anything that I need to just refer them straight to you. I'll send them your way. But thank you so much for your time. Uh, James, I'll see you and your lovely bride uh, next Sunday night at 8 p.m. Yeah, yeah. time here. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate thank it. So we like to end every show. Uh, not only with, with what Kelly and, and Seth and James has offered to you tonight, but I always like to personally let you know, no matter what, and lean in if you have to, no matter what you're going through right now, there's hope for you. There's always hope for you. Don't be afraid to reach out for it. Don't be afraid to ask for it. And you've seen it in James' life. It changed his life. So always remember, there's hope. Thank you for joining us tonight for an edition of Breaking the Silence. Next week, we'll have James and Lisa Brown right here, and we will continue this conversation. God bless you. Have an awesome week. Bye. Thank you for listening to Breaking the Silence with Dr. Gregory Williams. To contact Dr. Williams, dial 832-396-6525 or email him at shatteredbythedarkness at gmail.com. And don't forget to join us each Sunday night at 8 p.m. Central Time, 6 p.m. Pacific on BBS Radio Station 1 for the next episode of Breaking the Silence.